Hello, today we're starting session six on exchange rate regimes. Here we'll talk about the alternative exchange rate systems that a country uh, can adopt from completely fixed to flexible system. And most countries choose an exchange rate regime in between these two extremes. Also understand the advantages and disadvantages disadvantages of these varying exchange rate regimes as well as the role of the IMF. Look at single currency areas, monetary unions, EU a prime example, and then a brief uh, example of a currency crisis, the Mexican peso crisis of 94-95. Now exchange rate regimes are all modifications of the two categories, fixed exchange rates, where nation's currency is defined in terms of a fixed amount of a commodity, uh, gold or silver, or in terms of a fixed amount of another currency. At the other extreme are flexible or floating exchange rates, the value of a nation's currency that's allowed to float up and down in response to supply and demand of the foreign exchange market. Uh, we talked about in last class in session uh, five. Now, the uh, pie chart shows you, as of 2006, IMF members and the alternative exchange rate regimes that they have adopted. From a free float, 14% uh, of their members, uh, that includes the United States. Managed float, fixed peg, no separate tender, meaning they don't have their own currency. A currency board or an adjustable peg, and we'll talk about these different uh, systems. Fixed exchange rates uh, began, and I think you have a good history of um, the history of money in the Moss book has a, a chapter on this, began with gold standards were the first form of fixed exchange rate. And under a poor, uh, pure gold standard, a nation would keep reserves, gold reserves, uh, to back their uh, currency that they print or coin. Now, the Brenton Woods exchange system, which uh, was adopted after World War II, is a type of gold standard, and it was in effect from 47 to 1971, wherein the U.S. dollar and British pound were fixed to each other and to gold. So this was a modified uh, gold standard exchange rate system. Uh, this exchange rate system would guide the reconstruction and the years after World War II. Uh, the U.S. dollar, as we saw in the trades on the foreign exchange market, is a vehicle currency, and it came from this because the U.S. dollar was the only currency convertible to gold, and other currencies uh, set their exchange rates relative to the dollar. At this meeting, there also were two international uh, organizations established, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank, which had a different name at the time, but that's what we know it. Now, we'll talk more about the IMF, because this was to maintain order in monetary systems internationally, when the World Bank was focused more on promoting uh, economic development. The role of the IMF at this time of Bretton Woods after World War II, it was established in order to bring discipline to monetary, international monetary policy. It, as you said, as we said, there was a quasi-fixed exchange rate pegged to the U.S. dollar, which was linked to a gold standard, and um, this would control with this fixed or uh, exchange rate or one peg to the dollar, competitive devaluations and bring stability to world trade. That was its intent. It also um, imposed monetary discipline on countries. They couldn't uh, increase their, monet or their money supply at will. Uh, there was a discipline imposed of its peg to the U.S. dollar and uh, the IMF, and therefore it, uh, inflation was thought to be uh, better curtailed or regulated under this fixed exchange system. Two, the IMF was 
in existence to provide some flexibility. Um, a rigid policy of fixed exchange rate currencies pegged to the U.S. dollar um, might be too inflexible in case a uh, foreign currency or a, a country was, had a deficit in its balance of payments in its current accounts. So the IMF was ready to lend uh, money to uh, such a country in this situation and uh, help it through the business cycles and to provide some uh, slack so that they could address uh, issues in deficits. A country could devalue its currency by more than 10 percent with IMF approval over this period through 71. Now, a pegged exchange rate uh, system is what we were talking about. One currency is anchored to another instead of gold, and they were pegged to the U.S. dollar. A crawling peg exchange rates um, have this same uh, principle, except they are periodically adjusted by the government, allowing uh, for depreciations or appreciations better than a peg system. Now, right now, it's uh, suggested that um, China had a peg exchange rate system pegged to a basket full of currencies, and supposedly now, with their gradual uh, depreciation or appreciation of the uh, renminbi, that they are moving towards a crawling pig. But as part of your assignment is to decide how slow and why this is proceeding um, at such a slow pace. Fixed exchange rate systems, of which these are alternatives, um, are the norm for developing countries. Because if you tie um, currencies to a key currency, such as the dollar, one, you gain legitimacy. Uh, it is uh, recognized, therefore, um, their currency as a means of international settlement. It brings stability to import and exports. And again, too, with the fixed exchange rate, a key strength is its limits on inflationary uh, pressure. Now, the uh, fixed exchange rate system collapsed uh, in the 1970s. And part of this was what was going on in the United States, our economy. You had Lyndon Johnson's um, Great Society programs, which increased domestic spending. At the same time, you had the Vietnam War going on. And U.S. had to finance these increases in welfare programs and the war and finance that. And it brought on um, increased money supply and inflation. So there was speculation that the dollar would have to be devalued relative to other currencies, and it was. And the dollar at this time, after 71, was left to float on international currency markets, or it was a flexible system. No longer was there going to be um, the Bretton Woods pegged fixed exchange system where other currencies were pegged against the U.S. dollar. Now, managed float systems, um, these are alternatives of a clean float where you have free market forces of supply and demand, pushes and pulls towards the equilibrium price that we talked about last class. You also have a dirty float where um, it is allowed to move with market forces, but central banks um, may intervene to promote depreciation uh, of their currencies if they feel that is necessary. Other types of exchange rate policies are capital controls. Um, these may be imposed to prevent capital movements in the financial sector. As we saw, uh, the currency markets have 3.2 trillion daily volume. There's a lot of movement in and out. And governments uh, want to maybe control the balance of payments position and prevent speculative attacks. And they do this by restricting inflows, um, which tend to work uh, better than outflows because they reduce short-run capital into a nation. And outflow restrictions may help reduce uh, the impact of a crisis when it should occur. So governments uh, will impose capital controls. Also, dollarization. 
partial dollarization indicates the use of the U.S. dollar alongside domestic currencies. Some countries such as Panama have full dollarization where they use the U.S. dollar instead of their own sovereign currency. Uh, and this, the benefits, again, you can lower uh, inflation, decrease transaction costs with the United States, certainly, and it has a greater openness and transparency. The problem is you don't have the macroeconomic tool of monetary policy if you're using another uh, nation or the dollar as your currency. The advantages and disadvantages of uh, exchange rate regimes. Here you have a summary of the two uh, types, and as we saw, there are multiple or an array of exchange rate systems between these two. A fixed exchange rate is simple. It's an automatic rule for monetary policy. You need to have the underlying reserves, be it gold, a commodity, or another uh, currency or a basket full of currency in order to um, control your money supply. And it's very good on controlling inflation. The disadvantage is that you don't have independent monetary policy that you can wield in order to um, address uh, inflation, interest rates, et cetera. You're also vulnerable to speculative attacks. That is, if you don't put in capital controls, you can um, be a target for speculators. Floating allows a continuous adjustment in balance of payments, independent monetary and fiscal policies. It is uh, conducive to inflation. It can because independent money, monetary and fiscal policies, you can have governments increasing spending, increasing money supplies, and allowing inflation to uh, occur or not manage it very well. Uh, disorderly markets can disrupt trade and investment patterns. And you can, if you do have fiscal policies by governments that are risky, uh, it can cause problems. Uh, there is something called crony capitalism, where a government may induce um, banks to make loans to friends um, in certain uh, sectors. And this can cause problem if you have a free floating exchange rate. Monetary unions are single currency uh, areas. And the one we've talked about through this course has been the uh, European Union. But there are other ones listed, as you see, the West African Economic Monetary Union, Central African monetary union as well as Eastern Caribbean. Now, reasons why countries adopt com common currencies uh, reduces conversion and transaction costs, eliminates price fluctuations, increases interstate political trust, and exchange rates greater credibility. If you have an EU with um, 16 of the 27 uh, European Union members, adopting the euro, it does provide exchange rate greater credibility and hypothetically stability. But to be viable for this single currency area, you need to have synchronized business cycles, a high degree of labor and capital mobility, regional policies to deal with economic imbalances, and an integrated effort that goes beyond mere free trade. Now, as we've seen in the issues right now, certainly with Greece, their EU is grappling with economic or they have um, policies to deal with such an imbalance uh, and a debt service that Greece is unable to support. You have the same uh, concern about Spain, which is one of your cases. Now, the EU is the largest integrated, not only monetary union, but market in the world. And few countries are going to be able to prosper without selling goods in this European um, market. In 1991, with uh, the European community, members had a Maastricht Treaty, which aimed at some of these uh, common currency viable conditions. They had uh, worked to adopt uniform labor laws and work rights, define rights of residents to vote regardless of nationality, uh, health, cultural, uh, and safety 
hands were in the um, purview of the European Commission and the common currency under the European Central Bank. So they did move to more than just a monetary union, but to a market, a larger market, as a way to deal with global economics. And you have this, if you've gotten to strategy yet, you come across the term of market power, and that is what was behind the monetary union, as well as these other advantages. You have to remember that in the EU, it wasn't that long ago, they were all fighting each other in the world wars. You see other organizations such as this. We have NAFTA in North America, Mexico, and Canada. Uh, going back, the cartels, the oil cartels, were a way to gain market power by countries to um, collaborate and m have an agreement in which they address uh, together the global uh, economic demand for oil in that case. And this is one of the directions that, and one of the re rationales behind the EU was that they needed the market power to be competitive in our global economy as it is today. Now financial crisis, there are three types that have um, required involvement by the IMF. The currency crisis, where you have a speculative attack on the currency, and uh, the authorities, the uh, central bank, has to uh, spend large volumes of international currency to prop a currency up. Under a fixed exchange rate system, you have the loss of international reserves, and you'll have an official devaluation, likely. Under a flexible exchange rate system, you have uncontrolled rapid depreciation of a currency. Other types of crisis, financial crisis, are banking crisis, where there's loss of confidence in the banking systems, and it leads to runs on the banks, where individuals and firms withdraw their deposits, and foreign debt crisis, where, in which a country cannot service its foreign debt obligations, and uh, be it the government debt, which we distinguish from the external or international debt, uh, which is a question of the current account balance of payments. Currency crisis specifically, uh, speculative attacks, uh, weaken a currency a great deal because you have a result of selling. And we talked about speculation and expectations, how it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If speculators in the foreign exchange market anticipate a devaluation, they will sell off and they can start it snowballing to actually uh, occur, that the currency will devalue. Usually it ends by official devaluation or the adoption of a floating rate, which um, is flexible relative to supply and demand forces, or in the extreme case, a currency can completely crash. So um, the example I have here is the Mexican currency crisis of 1994-95. There were high Mexican debts, a pegged exchange rate at this time to the US dollar that didn't allow to a natural adjustment of prices. So in order to keep Mexico from defaulting on its debt, there was a 50 billion aid package um, from countries, a, forgiving debts to the IMF and from banks also. Um, their debt was paid by the IMF through this $50 billion aid package. After this uh, crisis, Mexico did devalue its currency, but then that wasn't enough and it moved to a floating exchange rate system for the peso, and that's what it has right now. But if you see just from these few months, from December 12th of 1994 to March 20th of 1995, the peso lost over half its value. So here uh, you see that currency crises are very real, and they require that the international organizations, uh, the IMF, as well as nations, uh, help them and provide aid in order to support their currency. Thank you.